What I was just going to tell you before we start is that I have some stills myself here that might be coming useful that have appeared of use just after the war. Alright, well, that would be amazing if you can talk about them. Definitely. Well, he'll, he'll, he'll probably, if he can't think about what sort of disease he's been doing, yeah. something like that, and he'll go into the details yeah. about it. But that's what they look like. That's another one. I looked. You know, I can have a look at them, sir. So. It's him, really. You know. It is. He waited six storm when he came back. Uh, Dentist chair. Yep. Yeah. Not had any anaesthetics. Amputations were carried out without anaesthesia. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Which sort of one? Yeah, yeah. That's another one. That's that's a bridge of the a view of the bridge before it was bombed near the trunk eye, and that's a, a typical scene of the accommodation we had. Right. And that's. Uh, the Chunkai Cemetery, as it was when we left it, is it now uh, um, taken over by the War Graves Commission. Oh, okay. uh, That's something to do, huh? Yeah. Uh, That's uh, a, a copy of the map that shows all the camps that were involved when uh, when we were building the railway. It's about 250 miles long from ba uh, uh, Thailand to Burma. Yeah. And these are all the stations. That one. That's the official one used by the Japanese railway yeah. battalion. They had separate battalions for looking after railways and things like that. Mm. And those are some paintings that were done by uh, prisoners of war. Was you allowed to have the materials then to paint and stuff, or what? was you give was you given the materials so you could paint and that, or was it something you had to like have well, covertly? Well, they, they, they managed to get all, they were still in, those were in Singapore. Right. A lot of uh, supplies in Singapore. As they think from uh, prisoner of war life, yeah, and yeah, they could get more or less anything. Then I built a, 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 a bandolier. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. You can keep them all yeah. separate. Okay. Uh, I'm liable to kick this over. <laughs> you ready, mate? I'll make a start. How are we doing, Grant? All right. You're looking lovely, bud. Like a film star. Pardon? Like a film star. Oh. Yeah. Right. right, Tom, thanks very much for inviting us to your home and yes. us to talk to you today. Yes. Um, all we want to do really is just get your side of the story. You tell us about your, your experiences yes. during the, the prison war know. camps and during the war. And yeah, are you ready to shoot now or not? Pardon? Are you ready to yeah, start we're just, now? Yeah, we're ready to go now, yeah? Right. Yeah. Well, um, of course, my story starts uh, in 1939 when I joined up. Right. Uh, my, a work colleague of mine uh, came to me one morning. I sat at my desk in, in the private hire department where I worked at Lancashire United Transport Limited and suggested we joined up. I said, You must be joking. <laughs> he said, No, I'm serious, Tom. Um, I've been my school pal all the time, and uh, he said we can get in the regiment with fancy. And uh, so we went up to Bolton, I agreed uh, after a few days, went up to Bolton and to the recruitment office there and found they wanted clerks, amongst other things, warehouse men, storekeepers, and uh, General RA, Service Corps, all, all the branches. So we fancied the, doing the job we were doing at home, clerical work. So um, 
We join, both of us joined the RAOC, Royal Army Ordnance Corps. Right. And the following day, we, we were on our way to Portsmouth, to Hilsey Barracks, which was the, then the headquarters of the Royal Army Ordnance Corps, mm -hmm. to begin our training. So um, we got down there okay and started training straight away. And um, we found ourselves um, uh, in the ammunition depot supplies line. And after training there, we were posted to Corsham in Wiltshire. Oh, yeah. Well, the, a big underground mine of um, uh, it was baffling, really. It was it built into the hillside round uh, Corsham, the hillside of Wiltshire, and there's uh, all sorts of ammunition, everything you could think of, and it's a secret. Nobody really knew about it, but it was the main supply depot uh, for the army. Oh, right. So uh, anyway, we we did that, and uh, we were both in this uh, caution depot for about twelve months, mm -hmm. and then we got split up, which was always a liability. And John was moved to uh, a, a small ammunition depot in Shropshire, and um, I was put on a posting abroad without knowing where we were going to. Uh, however, uh, we parted company, me and John, and uh, he was eventually uh, discharged from the army because of ulcers in his stomach. And uh, I continued with the ammunition services and uh, we went to Nottingham on a, a, a leave to uh, prior to going uh, abroad. However, in March uh, 1941, uh, uh, we were posted abroad and we went to Liverpool mm. to join a convoy of uh, vessels, destroyers, and all told about 30 odd vessels in this convoy going abroad. Uh, some knew where they were going, but we didn't know where we were going. So we were on the Duchess of York and uh, eventually sailed uh, one misty morning and uh, headed in the direction of America for four or five days, uh, uh, avoiding the submarines of the Germans. And then after about four or five days, we headed due south for another four or five days before turning east and going to uh, West Africa, a place called uh, uh, Freetown, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, to take on water. We didn't go ashore there. It was so blistering hot too. Uh, the warmest place I've ever been to, including POW life. Um, for a few days, to come what then, we went south to Cape Town. Half the convoy went to uh, Cape Town and half of it went to Durban, where we had a week's leave, as it were. We, we could go ashore and the locals of Cape Town used to line up with their taxis and cars and, and take us around the area, showing us what it was like around there. Well, after that, we went to, we rejoined our boats and the convoy split, in, split up into two. Half of it went to the Middle East and the other half went up to Burma, to um, Bombay in India. And then, uh, we uh, woke up one morning uh, to be told we were on our way to Singapore. There was no war out there, 
Singapore at the time. So off we went and uh, went down to Colombo and eventually to Singapore, Keppel Harbour, where we arrived early in May 1941. Of course there's no war out there as I say and um, we couldn't believe it. Uh, there was plenty of food, uh, we had good accommodation and uh, we started to get used to Singapore and um, I was being a sportsman, I was playing tennis, cricket and football in the regimental uh, leagues that they had out there because there's already a lot of men out there doing nothing really, only train for the Japanese invasion even when it came and uh, quite honestly we didn't think it was ever going to come but it did on the 8th of December uh, 1941, the Japanese, as you were, bombed Pearl Harbour. At the same time, they invaded northern Malaya, which is part and parcel of the Malay Peninsula that leads to Singapore. And they decided that, that was the way they are going to take Singapore and go overland. So it was it's a, like a long uh, peninsula and they were coming through the jungles and uh, rubber plantations and then going out to sea in boats and coming round lower down mm. so they were encircling the troops who were already up there and uh, we were sending ammunition up to them of course keeping them supplied because I was in the base ordnance depot in Singapore, which is actually on the island. Singapore is, is an island, actually. It's fairly small, but it's still, still large enough. And um, they were fighting a losing battle, because by this time the, the Prince of Wales had been sunk. And the, 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 the air forces were practically non-existent as far as we were concerned and they had uh, tanks and uh, most of our troops were using single shot uh, field rifles mm. and uh, the Japanese had automatics and things so although, although there was enough men out there we, we weren't equipped yeah. Uh, efficiently, really, to stop the rot. So slowly but surely, it was uh, unstoppable. They crept down uh, Malaya to uh, Singapore. We, we put up quite a bit of resistance there because they had to cross what's called the Johor Straits, uh, which is a, 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 a water that sur surrounds Singapore and uh, we put a stop to it for a few days but we're now in we're, we're getting into january and february now of, of, of 40 42 and um uh, 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 sorry, this went on for a few days and uh, on the thursday the 12th of february 1942 we were instructed to uh, leave our barracks and go to the base ordnance depot to try and defend the base ordnance depot, which never got round to because before that we were uh, withdrawn to uh, Singapore Railway Station uh, on Friday the 13th. Of, uh, of February 1942 and uh, Saturday we spent sorting ourselves out more or less um, there were a few ships still left that they could move people so a lot of the higher ranking people were moved during Friday night or Saturday night sorry and uh, we were sent forward to new positions uh, joining the regulars 
right arm, but we weren't, as best ordnance people, we weren't trained as a fighting force, but we, we, we were instructed to shoot any Japanese you saw. So we went to uh, up Bucket Timmer Road, which is a road that runs from the city centre uh, northwards to the causeway where the railway line crossed. And uh, by that time, um, uh, uh, the Japanese were, were, were coming, coming onto the island in small numbers because the causeway had been blown up to a certain extent to provide, to prevent, I should say, easy access to Singapore. But they eventually made it. And um, we, uh, uh, as I said, on Tip Bucket Timmer Road, and uh, we were told to stop firing. This is uh, it was about 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, the 15th of, of uh, February 1942, because the British uh, forces, Lieutenant Percival, the head uh, was uh, entering into talks about a possible surrender and the terms that would be applied. So uh, we did as we were told, we stopped firing, and then about an hour or so later, we had instructions to put down our firearms and ammunition in piles that uh, General Percival had decided to uh, surrender forces and ammunition to the, to the um, Japanese. So, because they, by that time the Japanese had taken over the reservoirs and um, electricity supplies on the island. So, uh, the following day we were told to go to the centre, which is a vast open space of, of grassland and uh, we had further instructions. We duly got there and we were instructed to go to an area of the island uh, uh, called Changi, where uh, there's a new airport now. But we were told to go there and we, we, we walked all the way from the city centre to Changi, probably about 20 miles. And, and when we got there, we were absolutely demoralised and tied out and more or less uh, lay down where we could get and had a good sleep, uh, again waiting for further instructions. Uh, which you really arrived, which uh, said that we had to stay where we were, uh, find accommodation, and uh, 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 we were captives. So uh, uh, we did that, and uh, we got used to eating rice, because the food we were getting, by that time we were pretty hungry, because we'd not seen a decent meal for ages. Uh, the cooks started to try and cook rice, and uh, we had all sorts of concoctions. A sloppy rice with uh, stiff rice and uh, some rice you couldn't eat at all. But uh, they eventually got to know how to cook it, steam it, and uh, it wasn't too bad in, in Changi because there was still quite an, a lot of food on the island mm -hmm. of uh, Singapore. It was very well stocked with food. and. Uh, we didn't live too badly then. So uh, we weren't doing very much uh, apart from being guarded by Korean guards. Uh, we were just getting through the days, waiting for further instructions, which eventually arrived in, in October. So we've been in Changi from February 42 to October 42 and uh, the Japanese had decided to move us up into Thailand. 
which is a, a long, long way off, and it will be transported there on the, the one railway line that ran from Singapore through to Bangkok uh, in cattle trucks. And the, the journey took four days or four nights, and uh, there was no sanitary arrangements at all. It was diabolical. It was terrible, a terrible four days that. Eventually, we, when we had over one meal a day, we stayed at various places in, in, in Malaya on the way up, and we were allowed out of these cut trucks, and uh, the Japanese had made arrangements for local people to uh, supply rice for us, a meal of rice and um, a, a few vegetables and uh, then on our way again to the next station. Anyway, we eventually arrived at a place called Bampong, which was where the new railway was going to start from uh, as a link off the main, right, main line and run through to Burma. Um, which the uh, Japanese hoped to conquer, of course. And um, uh, when we arrived, it was a monsoon season, and uh, they already built, built some accommodation for us, which was mainly bamboo and atop roof. Atop is a, is a wide leaf of, of a tree that was bent in two and sewn together somehow to make tiles about a metre wide and lapped on top of each other, which is quite, quite good actually. And, uh, but still, uh, the, the conditions we found ourselves in were pretty horrible. Uh, the the cook houses were hardly functioning, they had to keep moving because of the, the monsoon season. It flood one area, then it would flood another, and they keep moving their equipment until to somewhere where it's fairly dry, they could um, get fires going uh, to make us a meal, uh, which wasn't very appetising anyhow. But uh, we were there for two or three days and then marched to a place called Kanchanaburi in, uh, in Thailand. And um, that, that was one of the places to be the start of the railway. But we went a bit further. We went to a place called Chung Kai, mm -hmm. which was on the River Kwai. And uh, to get to the River Kwai, to Chung Kai, sorry, we had to cross the river and, um, and, and we could get just about get across without drowning. You could walk across. It was pretty deep, but uh, you could get across. And uh, we got to Junkai, where they'd already prepared uh, accommodation, as I've described, made out of bamboo poles and atop roof tops. And, um, we were told that's going to be our base camp. We, we were allocated to number two group, and uh, that would be our base camp. And um, we were allocated uh, about uh, two or three miles of railway to uh, complete before moving on to, uh, further up the uh, through the jungle. Uh, the job itself was pretty hard. We had to move earth. If we were building an embankment, we had to move from earth from the side to the embankment. Or if we were moving, making it into cutting, we had to dig out the cutting, of course, or move the soil. So that was monotonous duty. Not much rice, not much food. Uh, it was pretty horrendous. But we got through it. We were given tasks, a task of moving uh, a cubic metre of soil per day, per man, in the hours of daylight, which were 
6 o'clock in the morning to about 6 o'clock at night, 12 hours. And uh, we worked in groups of three. We had uh, what we called um, rice sack uh, and bamboo pole uh, stretchers. It was a fill, and one man would be digging and filling. We had two stretchers, and then the two men would carry the, the soil, dump it on the track, come back, and take the next one, and that went on all day. And we used to rotate our, our workload. He did a, a stretch digging, and, and they also did a stretch carrying. So that, that was day after day after day until they got the level that the Japanese wanted. When we finished that, we, um, we were moved on to the next, uh, next uh, section, which meant walking uh, a few miles to another camp and do the same thing all over again. But um, the work was, work was monotonous, and uh, on, on the, uh, the meals we were getting was inadequate. We got three meals of rice per day. The first meal in the morning would be uh, boiled rice with a spoonful of sugar on it. And that, that was every meal. Then at lunchtime, parties from the cookhouse would bring out the rice in uh, four-gallon four, four uh, uh, kerosene cans that was used to, used to carry kerosene and uh, we had a uh, meal on site and it took about 20 minutes and back to work and then back to the camp at night for another meal of rice and uh, we used to call it jungle water it was uh, vegetables boiled and that but it was just like green water it wasn't much use really. And uh, that went on day after day after day for three and a half years, moving on, digging, also building bridges. We had to build a bridge. It, were, it went over a ravine. We had to build a bridge across it, which was mainly constructed of trees, which sawn down manually with a, a, a two metre so, you know, yeah. going through it, uh, felling it, and then we had teams of uh, elephants with uh, Thai mahouts to drive them and drag these uh, tree trunks from the jungle to the, the railways, the, the ravine was, where the Japanese engineers would uh, have them sawn into the lengths they wanted and start constructing bridges. So it could be anything really when you went on the side in the, in the morning, providing you're fit enough. And by this time, uh, m malaria had struck and uh, dysentery and various tropical diseases. Mm. Uh, but uh, there'd be a parade for singing in the morning and the Japanese would supervise it and uh, they determined who should go on the working parties. But uh, often the uh, medical officers would uh, say, well, this man's, this man's not fit to work 12 hours up in the jungle uh, in the heat of the day and uh, we want him excused for a couple of days while he got round off his, uh, his malaria or dysentery. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But um, it was hazardous, that job. Uh, so uh, so that, uh, that went on for, uh, what, uh, 12 months. We were doing, building the railway, and we, 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 we finished it on time actually, but um, there was a lot of lives lost, mm. and 
The main thing was that you had to have a strong, very strong willpower to keep going. Otherwise, you'd had it. It, it was very depressing, and uh, it, it, we used to get occasionally uh, the emperor's birthday or something like that, a day off. He had me day. That was. Uh, we look forward to them. It gives you a chance to get into the river, have a good wash down, and uh, try to get the bed bugs out of our, our bed spaces and uh, get round off dysentery, but you're more or less always in a state of dysentery. And um, malaria, as I say, kept striking and striking. I'd, Personally, I had 32 attacks of malaria in various degrees, some worse than others. Uh, but I got through that, and you look if you got a pinch of uh, um, um, quinine. Uh, quinine. quinine, powdered quinine, which you, you had to get down somehow. Now we were using the river. Uh, for our cooking, it was our drinking water, it was also our bathing water. And uh, you used to have to boil the water before you, you drank it and uh, boil it again. Mm. And then to be sure, boil it again. Because that was the main source of problems with, with uh, your bowels. And, uh, uh, it was a, a question of survival, really. Survival of the fittest. How did you cope mentally with all that then? Uh, pardon? How did you cope mentally uh, to endure all that? How did you cope with it mentally? How did you get through it? I know you said you need a re real strong willpower. But well, this was you it. Through? You had to have the will to get through. Uh, that was the main thing. And uh, keep each other uh, well. Like, if you met your bed panel, bed mate next to you, and the, there was about two or three hundred in a hut, and there was about ten huts, you know, uh, you used to have to look after your pal and uh, get his meals, bring his meals for him, and things like that. Uh, so it was great of helping each other. Right. And there was a strong, very strong bond grew between prisoners of war. Very strong bone. As I say, we, we eventually finished the, the, the railway line and we came back uh, in open trucks. It was all right, that wasn't too bad coming back again. And we, we crossed, we built a, a bridge called the Wumpo Bridge, which is a very long bridge. It was a work of art, really. and. Uh, when we were comp uh, uh, building it, we were under the instructions of the Japanese engineers and uh, 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 Korean guards, and uh, you'd be sawing down trees, uh, 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 the uh, uh, elephants would be dragging them down to the site where the Japanese wanted them, and they were cutting joints in, and uh, put him uh, metal uh, bolts through to hold it together. But uh, rather rickety, in my opinion. Anyway, we got over it, we came back, we, we got back to our base, base camp, where things were a bit easier, but the food wasn't any easier, which is the main thing. But. Um, uh, the fella called Leo Britt, he'd, he'd been in the, on the stage in London and uh, he was a marvellous man, he could remember a lot of the, the storylines and uh, he used to put on some good shows. And there were also people who uh, had been on the, uh, the stage, the fella called Frankie, he had a, an accordion. He was a professional. He could play in any tune he thought of. Oh, luckily, I was in the same camp as him quite often when we were leapfrogging each other yeah. camps. Uh, 
anyway, we'll be there. And they used to go around the huts uh, playing his accordion. Uh, and I, by this time, I built this, this guitar, of course. And I used to sing a few George Foreman songs. Just to, and we move up the up the, um, the the camp line, and then back again, and uh, keep the trees up there. Well. So things were quite a bit better then, but the illnesses and um, uh, and things happened, and and uh, at a critical moment, uh, cholera broke out, an epidemic of cholera. Mm -hmm. And you could leave your camp leave in the morning, and uh, two or three or four or five people would have been moved onto a, a, a separate area because they had cholera. And they probably lasted a couple of days and, and uh, went like that. They all called through uh, uh, water uh, imperfections. Yeah. And uh, all together, about, about 15,000 died in the construction of the railway alone. And uh, there in uh, Wargrave cemeteries in Chunkai, which was our base camp, and Kanchanaburi, which was the number four group camp. So uh, I lost quite a lot of lives out there. And, uh, I'm often asked how, how did I survive and uh, you can't help but say it was pure luck. You're either lucky or unlucky mm. to, to survive them. If, you, if you're in a camp where there's no quinine, for example, malaria, it, it was deadly. Malaria, a deadly disease because it got into your mind, in your brain and uh, it used to see you off. Hallucinations, it was uh, miles away. You, had, you were lucky, yeah. really. I well, say I'm 99 now, so touch wood, <laughs> I did all right. There's, you lost a lot of weight as well, didn't you? There's quite a few older than me. Yeah. As, a, as a doctor in London, by the name of Franklin, Dr. Bill Franklin, he is 105. Wow. And, uh, we attended a, a service of remembrance a few years ago, Ronald and I, and uh, we'd had a service on the Horse Guards Parade and did the usual walk from Horse Guards Parade past the uh, War Memorial to Westminster Abbey, for where we had a lovely meal. And he walked it. Uh, Ronald was pushing me in, in uh, uh, wheelchairs I've got, but uh, I, I think I lost my legs in, in, on the tennis courts at Lee on a, on a football field because I was mad on sport. Yeah. I used to play tennis uh, three or four times a, a week and I'd chase anything <laughs> to get it back and not realising my legs would give way eventually, which they have. So, that um, uh, that's more saw, saw the the railway finish. Now there were so many people still left that the Japanese decided to give us another war effort. That was building earth strips for the uh, fighter craft to alight, take off and alight from in in Thailand and. Uh, I was given one, along with hundreds of others, of course, in southern Thailand. And uh, that wasn't a bad journey. We were decent, uh, we were still on open trucks, but they weren't ex cattle trucks, and then they used to stop for toilets and things like that. And we got down to southern Thailand, a place called Pachaburi, and uh, built a an airstrip there from uh, January 1945 till the end of July in 1945 when uh, it was finished. Of course the war finished a few weeks after 
and uh, the first plane to arrive was in Dakota and uh, we flew from there to Rangoon uh, where we went into uh, the various medical hospitals there and uh, given the once over and uh, allotted for uh, trips back to England and again I was lucky there I got on the first ship that arrived in Southampton in uh, October, 8th of October 1945, the first ship back in England. So I was lucky there. Uh, I've kept pretty well since. I, 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 I was a tennis champion uh, on a couple of occasions at Lee. And, uh, are they grass courts? Are they in Lee? Or are they well, the, no, the uh, uh, shale court. Right, but uh, we, we had, uh, a fellow of mine, while we were in Singapore, uh, in that period where there's no war, uh, a fellow from Leicester called Sid Holland, he was a good player, and we used to, there's only about two of us and there's about four courts, but uh, everyone didn't take up sport, of course. Some got back on the bed and had a siesta. Yeah. But we used to go and play in the last tower before the sun went down in Singapore. And um, eventually we, we entered an open competition at the Singapore Chinese Recreation Club. We hadn't realised it, but they were playing on lawn and the ball didn't get up at all and we lost miserably. I think we lost 6-1, 6-1, yeah. but it was a good experience. Yeah. Um, I said, yeah, I'm back to tell the tale. Now, I might have missed one or two things out while I was going through, so I'll just exercise my mind. Yes, one, one, of, one of them is, um, I've told you about the railway trip, from Singapore to Thailand, it was four days and four nights, and that was horrible. That was the worst four days I spent. Uh, whilst we were in, in uh, Changi, we were given forms to fill in, saying we wouldn't try and escape. But between me and you, there was no chance of escaping no. uh, out there, because all the rest are the Chinese, Malays, or uh, um, the, um, the people up in Thailand, the Thais. So you should be recognised. <laughs> and then they, they probably put price on their, our heads. If, if, uh, if they spotted an Englishman walking around the street, let us know, we'll give you so many pounds to do it. So I never tried it on myself. Uh, the forms not, uh, anyway, we um, we didn't sign them, these forms. So in consequence, where we'd occupied a very big area in Changi, well, all the area of Changi spread out and plenty of room. We were concentrated in a, what appears to have been a, a barrack block belonging to one of the army, army battalions out there. I think it was a... a uh, Argyle and Sutherland Islanders, mm. one, one camp, and we were all put in one camp. We were even sleeping on the parade grounds, yeah, and we, we were digging the parade area into slit trenches for toilet requirements, because that was the only type of uh, uh, toilet requirement. Uh, uh, requirement we had and it was always slate trenches mm. even in the jungle there were slate trenches um, horrible things uh, maggots crawling up the side of them and uh, it was um, as I said previously horrendous uh, that was one uh, I told you I built this um, ukulele which I, I've used I know you dealt with the and I, I donated that ukulele to the Imperial War Museum. Right. Now that's, that's still on view 
and the Imperial War Museum North, um, Salford. Yeah. And uh, it's open every day. And uh, when I donated, I, I, I specified that I didn't want it put in a back room somewhere. I wanted it to be on view. Yeah. They've honoured that requirement ever since then. And, and we, we get back there from time to time, mm. and doing little mm. speeches, talking to children who were visiting and things like that. So what do you think that ukulele represents then? Like, uh, what do you think that ukulele represents? Well, the ukulele, the ukulele, for me, it was, uh, I've always liked making things. And since I come back, I made a sailing dinghy. I used to sell it on Lee Flash. And uh, from parts, which I had to trim and put together and, and that. And uh, I was satisfied when I made it. And that was so satisfaction. And, uh, I was, as, as a consequence, I found I was taking off other jobs right. to be in the concert party, as was part of the orchestra, and, uh, or doing songs uh, in a group, uh, mm -hmm. you know, singing George Formby songs. Because yeah. a lot of people knew George Formby, and a lot of people in Lancashire up in the POW world. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's another part of life right there. Are there some of your fondest memories then? Pardon? Are there some of your fondest memories from that time playing in the playing the ukulele? Uh, yes, that's right. Well the other thing was that unfortunately I lost my best friend. Uh, my army best friend. He was a staff sergeant like myself. And he, he came from Grimsby. Mm. Now he didn't go up onto the railway when the parties were first sent up there. I think he was ill at the time. And um, I, I, I was sent up with another lot. And uh, he didn't come up until the last minute when they were pushing to get the railway finished. And they were sending a lot of people who should never have been sent up. They were all sick, already sick. And he, he, he was a cholera victim. And unfortunately, he's still up there. Uh, he was cremated um, up in Thailand because they, they used to burn all the cholera victims. Mm. It was so serious right there. So. Have you ever had the opportunity to go back? Yes, I've been back twice. Yeah. I uh, did a. Uh, a uh, movie, and I've also done about five or six albums of photographs out there, visiting the War Grave Commission's nice. uh, uh, graves, which are uh, immaculately maintained out there. And they have the record of Les' uh, um, his death. Uh, up, up in the town. It was near the Burma border then. Nice. I never got to the Burma border. The first I got was a two, what they call 226 kilometre camp. Because there's no, no, no uh, villages or towns up in, the, uh, in, in Thailand, especially up in the north, because the Thais and the Burmese don't get on very well together. And uh, he got a bit further than me, but he, unfortunately he didn't come back, poor lads. He was a great pal of mine. We used to, uh, again, going back to the uh, period when there was no war out there, we used to go out at night uh, to uh, uh, a cinema called the Cathay, and there were the first, first class films. Mm -hmm. They were always up to date. Just released, they were flown out to Singapore on uh, these flying boats right. from uh, from um, um, uh, from America, from Pearl Harbor way. And he, he used to, the plane used to land every day about four o'clock in the afternoon, and then take off the following morning, take him post and stuff back from Singapore. 
until the war started, of course, and that, that stopped. But that's now it was you at Premier's and it was called, called the Union Jack Club uh, in Singapore. And you can get steak, eggs, chips, peas and onions, fried onions, uh, for next to nothing. Yeah. And um, the, the cinema, these films, or the road to ballet and, you know, the Bing Crosby films, and all for We had some good nights out together, men, men lads. Yeah, I've been mistaken tonight, Ron. Uh, maybe how you constructed the ukulele. I don't think you've touched on how you made the ukulele. Uh, oh yes. Well, again, a lot came into it. Um, before I went up onto the railway, we were given jobs around Singapore for the Japanese, and they're working in the warehouses the dockside work warehouses, unloading their ships that were bringing stuff in by that time, or um, building memorials to the, the few Japanese who had died in the process of t taking Singapore. And uh, I was, uh, in June, I was put on a, on a party to work at Kranji. Because they stick from Changi, all these words about air then, Kranji. And that was near the, the uh, Kranji Naval Wireless Station. Yeah. And uh, there's a deserted village uh, near to that place. And it had been, it had been bombed by the Japanese. And uh, I was walking through one day and uh, I saw this broken down mandolin and the gears that you used to tighten up the strings yeah. were still in tight. So I took those off and I thought, I'll have a go making a, a banjo because I had a, a, a ukulele bef before the war and I had. Uh, I bought one on the way out to Singapore at Cape Town and to, just to amuse myself playing yeah. piano. And um, then I looked round to find wood, suitable wood to make a sound box and, uh, and the fret to take the uh, yeah. frets, things like that, and uh, put it all together over about three months and finding nails that are long enough for, to, to use, you know, thin enough. And um, eventually made it and got it tuned up <laughs> and uh, brought it back. I thought it was a bit of a job bringing it back because you, you always had your kit bag and you have a sack uh, uh, to carry. And your rifle. So um, I had my hands full of getting it back. Uh, uh, anything else, Ronald? Where did you get the strings from, Dad? Oh, the strings. Well, the strings were telegraph wire. It was a cut and take, they call it separate strands inside the telegraph wire. And uh, I tried them out and uh, found it worked all right, so I used telegraph wire <laughs> to, make, to, put, to uh, uh, create the strings. The bridges, those were easy to make, the bridges on a wooden with four slots on for the four strings, and uh, there was no problem there. Did you have to tune it by ear? Yes, that's tune right, yes. Yeah. And uh, GCAA. Uh, the, the, the notes from the four strings right. used. And uh, used, to sing, used to tune it to the tune of My Dog's Got Fleas. My Dog's Got Fleas. <laughs> and it's a turn, you know. And then you could tell when you played the chord whether it was right or not, you know. It's either flat to sharp or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, I got through that all right. Anything else, Ronald? Not really. Yeah. Uh, 
really. It's fantastic, Tom. Can I just yeah. ask you? Uh, that's more or less the, the end of my experiences. Yeah. The worst thing was the food, of course, and the intolerable work mm -hmm. load, working through monsoon seasons. It would, the salt wouldn't come off your spade, you know. Oh, I know, it's a meter stick. Um, each guard had what they called a meter stick. And when we finished our task, or thought we finished our task for the day, we'd tell them we finished, and uh, they'd measure it. And uh, it'd be uh, three cubic meters, of course, if it was right. But if it was wrong, that was it. Out come the stick, it became a beating stick. They bash you on the back with this meter stick. Now that could be anything from an inch, half an inch, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to whack you with. Um, in the mornings, uh, we had to count in, in Japanese, which was something like this. Echi ni san si go roko, sichi achi ku ju. That's up to ten. Then it just repeats. Echi ku ju, echi is eleven. One, uh, and then echi ju is ten. Yeah. And then and, and, oh, another one, make it eleven. <laughs> so if, if, if it's. Uh, Stopped in the sequence of going along the line at your knee, San Sego, Rocco. Even Ronald can use a few words now. Um, you used to get a slap across the face because you, you hadn't uh, learned the numbers. <laughs> but uh, they'd give you a slap across the face for nothing and you just could not retaliate. It was fatal to retaliate. Uh, officers were moved to Taiwan or somewhere and the, the lieutenant colonels and below were taken prisoners of war with us and they suffered the same anxieties and illnesses that we did. And Ronald's enjoyed reading that, haven't you? Yeah, I read it to him because of his eyes. He reads somewhere. me a couple of chapters each day. And loads of books and dad has, and that's the best account, true to life. Oh, yeah. Have you had any further questions? Any? I just want to ask you one thing. What? Pardon? You've obviously been through a lot of tough times. What advice have you got? Any advice? What you give people who are going through any tough times or dealing with difficult yeah, things? Yeah, no, not beginning one. Uh, not big can I, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. He's asking you, have you any advice you can give to people who are going through tough times, given what you? Oh, well. And it's very difficult to, because you don't know the exact circumstances. Yeah, but the thing is, is, to, is, is to keep strong, keep goodwill. Mm -hmm. uh, things can change, and you can probably make them change if you, you've got the willpower and the ambition to, to improve life that you're suffering at the present time. But that's the, the main thing. Um, our motto, uh, this uh, um, association, Forest Primor, is to keep going the spirit that kept us going. So this is quite a good motto yeah. when you come to think about it and what you experience. You had, had that spirit to keep going, that willpower. And uh, it's been a good association, that. It's only just now that the, the um, small uh, branches are closing down. Right. And there's not a lot of us left, of course, now. Mainly ni all in the 90s. Hmm. And uh, I was more or less suffered the same things. Because we all suffered the same. Yeah. There's no discrimination. You all suffer the same. Silence, illnesses, lack of food. Yes, it was it was a grim, grim life. Yeah. I wouldn't like to go through it again, but uh, I got through it. Well, you did it, so we don't have to go through it. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah.
But it's amazing, an amazing story, Tom, and thanks for letting us. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, to your talk. Yes, I do. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know what to expect when you come. I don't know whether you're inviting us to go and give a talk somewhere. Oh, right. oh, yeah. Sorry for the confusion. Well, giving you a talk, you can tape this and put a play it, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the <laughs> plan. Hopefully, we'll be able to show this to. Some of the young young yes, people right. the trust and that. I think uh, I go to the Imperial War Museum time to time and uh, they have what they call Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. Where, as far as I was concerned, they, they allocated me to the case where my ukulele is on spam and the group of children and the school teacher would come in, gather around listen to what I had to say yeah. and ask questions and probably have a photo shoot, you know. <laughs> they keep. Brilliant. So uh, that's very interesting, but uh, uh, you know, it gets you down to a certain extent. Yeah. Keep going back and that. Yeah. Will we get through it? Yeah. Well, we appreciate you. Yeah, that's right. Today, anyway. Yeah, I've enjoyed the visit. Yeah. Thanks very yeah, much. Right. Will we see you at the breakfast next month? Yeah. Will we? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. When is it? The second? Second Monday of every month. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Matt McNannan. That's right, yeah. Because I, I was a fan of his when he came to play. You must have been the only one then. What? You must have been the only one. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say that. I'm not telling him that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I liked his, his style of playing. He's a good goal kicker. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, the biggest biggest centre three quarter we've ever had. <laughs> he could get over the line, he could fall over. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we've signed 13 players on by now. Oh, it was just enough to make a team up for yeah. next season. <laughs> Can I offer you, lads, a cup you know. of tea or coffee? I'm fine, thanks. Um, I'm cold drink. Uh, that I'll have a glass of water. Yeah, that's water. Yeah, water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. it's too warm in here. I, I, I think you probably agree with me. Everybody says it. It's memory. It's it amazing. Absolutely. The days. Absolutely. The days. All yeah. the months. The days yeah. as well. Figuring the names of the places. Yeah. I know. Unbelievable. It's yesterday. Yeah. We're talking yeah. 70 odd years ago. Yeah. I think you're a, a remarkable man. You really are. Fantastic. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, I feel very ordinary, quite honestly. It was nice having you. No, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing story, though, isn't it?